Well, thank you, Connor, for inviting me. I'm also one of the life sciences colleagues, and I can totally underwrite what my other life sciences colleagues said about electrical engineers. They are fantastic, and the school is super welcoming. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, as I said, I'm a biologist by training, um, but my PhD is in material science, and so I have a big fable for interdisciplinary research. And today I'm going to talk to you about my latest adventure in interdisciplinarity, and that is uh, my Vice Chancellor's Fellowship, which I started two years ago, in which I'm trying to grow human tissue on soft robots. And uh, being interdisciplinary, I um, spend my time between two schools. Uh, I'm in the Adam Perryman lab in the School of Cellular Molecular Medicine, which is a sort of biofabrication tissue engineering lab, and uh, Jonathan Rossiter here in Scheme and in the robotics lab hosts me on the soft robotics site. So growing human tissues, you ask, why on earth would you want to do that? Uh, there's two good reasons for that. Number one is it comes in very handy when you lose an organ or a tissue. Um, you could just replace that if you could make that in the lab. At the moment, we're relying on donated organs to replace kidneys, hearts, livers, so on. Um, so it would be great if we could just make that in a lab, don't have to wait. The other reason is that for a lot of conditions like arthritis, you lose the cartilage that keeps your bones from grinding together when you move, and cartilage does not regenerate naturally. So it would be great if we could just make some cartilage in the lab and replace that here so the person is not in pain anymore. The other reason why you might want to grow human tissue in the lab is you can use it as a model where you can test the safety of new drugs or the efficacy of new compounds on without having to use an animal model. And something that's emerged in recent years um, are these organoids. So you take cell types you find in the liver or the heart and you make these little mini organs out of them. They recapitulate roughly the 3D structure of an organ. You can plug them into some sort of microfluidic chip and then simulate the blood flow over it. You could plug those chips together and have a body on a chip. And so this is a really good system for us to do high throughput screening in a very cheap way without having to use animals. So how do we grow human tissues at the moment? Uh, you usually take a biopsy from a person, from some tissue you're interested in making in the lab. You take the cells out, you expand them. That means you just put them through culture until you have loads of cells because you need quite a lot of cells to make tissue. And then classically, we had these scaffolds. These could be polymeric scaffolds or gels that you could seed your cells on, and they would infiltrate that and be in a three-dimensional geometry, just like in a real tissue, rather than just like on a 2D surface. And then you would just keep that um, maturing, uh, put some chemicals in that the tissue needs or the cells need to form into a biologically functional tissue that takes about four to six weeks depending on the tissue you make uh, and then the graft is ready biologically functional tissue you put it back into the patient now in recent years things have really moved on on the fabrication side of things so instead of just using preformed scaffolds where you have really restricted geometries that you can use. We now have 3D printers uh, where we put cells into bio-ink, usually a hydrogel, and we can extrude that like through a, you know, a nozzle, uh, like a real 3D printer that you know from your plastics and uh, stereolithography printers. You um, can make really free-form shapes, really complex shapes using different cell types. Uh, and so we can make much more um, sophisticated constructs now. But the trouble is, when we go to leave them to mature, we still use technology from the 1960s, and that is tissue culture plastic. These are these plastic plates. You can see a very fancy 3D printer here, and um, someone's just printed lots of little constructs into the wells of this little plastic plate. We put this into an incubator. It's basically just a warm cupboard, uh, and this is where it stays. This is not terribly physiologically relevant, right? When you look at how your tissues grow in your body, how they are formed in the womb in a baby, you are not just a plastic surface in a warm cupboard, right? There is a lot of fluid flow going on. You are made of soft materials. Your tissues experience a lot of tensile and compressive strains because you are moving all the time. We don't recapitulate any of that 
in our current technologies. Um, and this is a real limitation for our capacity to really grow complex organs or tissues in the, in the lab. A lot of tissues need mechanical cues to mature into biologically functional tissues. Uh, and this is where the robots come in. What is a soft robot? How can it help? Well, Disney tells you everything you need to know about robotic classification. Um, a soft robot is Baymax, for example, from the film Big Hero. He's made out a soft material, and he's actuated by inflating him. Whereas Wally, in the film Wally, is a classic hard shelled robot. It's made of metal, and he's actuated with motors and gears. If you think about who looks more like a human or feels more like a human, it's, of course, Baymax, because he's soft and squishy like we are. Um, if you think about what actuates us, what makes us move, it's our muscles, of course. They are also soft and squishy. And in fact, the first time I heard about soft robotics was when I was working with Sabine, and I was sharing an office with a soft robotics crowd, and they kept referring to their actuators as artificial muscles. Um, and... In fact, the classic, one of the classic um, artificial muscles is McKibben actuator. It's basically just a little tube that you can inflate and it actuates. Um, and it shares a lot of, um, so there's just some values here on dynamic range and you know, power density, some um, parameters of this actuator, and then biological muscles. And a lot of these figures look very similar. So they have a lot of quant uh, qualities that are very similar to real biological muscle. And this is a very cool video from a Japanese group that is making this skeleton move by these soft, uh, pneumatically actuated uh, tubes that are arranged just like your muscles are and can make the skeleton move in a very um, organic way. So I'm really excited. I was really excited about these materials and just the term artificial muscle. I thought this would be the perfect substrate to grow tissue on because this is how your tissue grows in the real world. I'm particularly interested in skin in this context because, of course, skin interfaces very closely with your muscles. And the way we grow skin on the lab at the moment is like this. So again, these plastic plates come into play. Um, rigid, there's no fluid flow, there's nothing, no stretch, no compression. Um, the way we grow it is in these little inserts. You can pop them into the wells of this plate. Uh, you do that because at the bottom of this insert, there's a porous bottom here, at the bottom of the plate, you can put your cell culture media or the chemicals that the cells need to survive. And at the top, you can just grow the tissue at the, at the air interface. It's very important for skin to be exposed to air. And this uh, setup is very classic setup to grow and test skin on. But again, not terribly physiologically relevant. Um, and so my big challenge was to marry up these two concepts, use the tissue culture platforms that we are used to, that are so widely used and established, but somehow make them more physiologically relevant, make them move. And the solution I came up with are these actuatable inserts. So they fit into these plates just like these guys, but now they are made of PDMS. PDMS is a silicone, it's quite soft. Um, and if you sort of look at the cross-section of my little insert. You have a porous membrane here, just like the bottom of this insert. And then there's an air channel running around that, enclosed by this soft silicone. And you can access the air channel just with a tube. And when you, uh, you know, change the air pressure in that uh, insert, you can make the membrane move. Beauty is you can put this into these six well plates that we all know and love in tissue culture, and you can use a syringe pump, for example, to move the air around. And I've got a video to show you what it looks like when you look onto this membrane and you suck the air out. You get this sort of this expansion of the central membrane, and when you push air in, you get compression, sort of buckling down. Um, and so this starts to look like you know some sort of weird breathing organism <laughs> that you can grow you know, cells or tissue on onto this porous membrane, for example. But now you don't have this in a rigid environment. You have this actually in something that's soft and that moves. Uh, this is my first excursion into uh, modeling using uh, Inventor strain stress analysis tool. I was uh, poo-pooed for that because that's not the cool way to do it, but it's the easy way to do it if you've never done it before. And I just wanted to know what sort of strains do you get when you expand this membrane, when you suck the air out. Um, that's the maximum pressure really I can achieve to sucking air out, uh, the maximum actuation. Um, and I just wanted to get a ballpark figure. Uh, and it turns out that around these pores, you get quite high strains, about you know, 27%, um, where sort of on the solid membrane, it's a bit lower, or 
percent, 17 percent. Um, and this is actually quite physiologically relevant. If you think about your fist, if you make a fist, that's about six percent strain on your skin. If you bend your hand forward, it's about 20 percent strain on your skin in this area. So I was really happy with, with these sorts of values, these ballpark figures. We also validated this experimentally, um, DIC and all these engineering things, um, but I skipped right through to the exciting bit um, to actually growing cells on that, and this is where it would have been handy. Hmm. Anyway, so of course PDMS, uh, I'm not sure you can see that very well, uh, is not a very, uh, is, is an artificial substrate. Cells won't really grow on it properly. Um, if you put them, these are skin cells that are took out of someone's skin, um, they don't grow really well. Uh, the, the red is the cytoskeleton, it's a skeleton of the cell that you can see, and the blue is the little uh, nuclei. Um, this was one of those animation things, which of course doesn't work. If you coat the surface of the PDMS with a protein that the cells know from the skin and from the body, and you just put that on the surface, you get a really dense cell carpet growing on PDMS that's been functionalized for that. And if you zoom in, this is just two cells growing on this functionalized uh, PDMS surface. You can see these little green dots, and these are called focal adhesions. These are protein complexes that the cells use to feel what's going on around them, the mechanical environment. So this tells me that they are really um, holding on to the substrate, and if I move it, they will feel it. So that's been a really exciting result. I then wanted just to look at, okay, if I've got my membrane, these are pores there, the little blue dots are the cell nuclei that have just um, uh, cells growing on this membrane. If I move this membrane, will the cells actually move as well or will it just ping off? Um, and the way I did that is just took a picture before actuating and after sort of stretching the membrane out. And I look at the distance between two nuclei and see how that changes. And from that, I work out the strain um, that the cells experience. And uh, also like the modeling data, cells growing in the vicinity of the pores, so this is kind of this uh, region of interest here, experience higher strains, again, around 20 seven, 30 percent, and the cells growing in the solid area here experience these lower strains. So that's uh, really corroborating that, um, that model. Uh, I'm more interested really in growing things in 3D, so sort of uh, making a tissue type material rather than just a 2D layer as I've shown you. Uh, and I thought, okay, if I put uh, cells in sort of a collagen gel, that's um, very typical material you use to make skin because that is the material that makes your skin skinny, uh, collagen. So if I suspend those cells in a gel like this and I put it on the surface and I then start actuating it, stretching it out, will the strain actually be uniform in that 3D environment? Um, you know, and just looking at the model, this looks like you know, these walls are bending outwards. So you know, it might just be that the cells that are close to this membrane will feel actually a higher strain than the ones that are up here because you know, uh, of the shape of the device. And I did a very similar experiment. I put my cells into this gel, um, and the blue dots, again, are the cell nuclei. And in this experiment, I took pictures of Z-stack through my, uh, my gel, so I have X, Y, Z information. First thing I saw is that when you stretch out the membrane, your gel starts to compress, right? If you stretch it out, you know, it can't make more gel. It needs to go somewhere. So the, the, the gel compresses down. Um, and I looked again at the X, Y strain, uh, in the different Z positions. So one is very close to the membrane. Um, and as you go further away into the gel, that's just the XY strain that reduces uh, actually quite significantly. Uh, and this is really interesting because no one ever looks at this when we do, <laughs> probably because no one ever works with engineers. Uh, when biologists do that, it's like, yeah, we did something in 3D and we stretched it and this is what happened. But actually, what is the, the strain map in 3D? We don't know. So I'm working with a guy uh, in my group who's an engineer by background who's making these amazing 3D strain maps. We don't have the data yet, but I'm really excited about working with engineers and engineering mathematicians because that's what they can do. And I don't know this. Um, lastly, I wanted to make some real skin on there, and I work with a group in uh, Düsseldorf. They're experts in growing skin in the lab and making models uh, of skin. And here's a cross-section of the skin we made on this porous uh, PDMS um, device. So you can see the PDMS disc would sit here, and these were the big pores that were there. I was really worried about those really big pores. Um, but the cells just grow right through it and encapsulate um, the PDMS disc. And this lighter pink here, that's the dermis, that's 
that's the lower layer of your skin, and the darker pink is epidermis, that's the very outer layer that, is, that gives you the protection um, of your skin. So we were able to make these uh, dermal epidermal um, models on these devices, and this is just a very fancy picture using a very specific antibody stain to look at whether this is a biologically functional material uh, tissue. Uh, the epidermis, this red stuff, you only find this keratin 10, you only find it in epidermis if it's properly differentiated, and it is. We see loads of it here. It's great. Uh, and this is the green stuff. It's called bimentin. It's just a protein you find in dermis when that is properly mature. So we made some really biologically functional mature tissue on these uh, porous devices, which is exciting. Uh, so yeah, the next thing for me really is um, to... Uh, yeah, to look at effects on the tissue when we grow these things under actuation. Um, and for me, the, the big conclusion really is to think of these things as artificial muscles. You just use these words um, <laughs> really nearly, but it's actually a really quite powerful picture for us biologists to envision that and to use that in our practice for tissue engineering. Um, and actually, there is lots of excitement in our community around robotics, um, especially in sort of regenerative medicine, so making tissues to go into patients and using robots to grow them under more lifelike conditions. Um, so yeah, I'm applying for Future Leader Fellowship with this wonderful school, uh, and hopefully I get it and be here and do exciting things with you.